Yeah, yeah, beautiful. We can, yes. mate. We can. Sweet. Love it. All, All right. The masses are getting restless on YouTube, apparently, so let's get this, <laughs> this, this shit going. Uh, uh, I'll press go live on YouTube. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> All righty. Tim, whenever you're ready, we can get underway. Hello and welcome everyone to the second AFL Fantasy Fanatics episode for season 2024. We are recording live on Twitter and YouTube on Saturday the 17th of February. And we're 26 days out from the start of the AFL Fantasy season and less than three weeks away from opening round action. I'm your host and AFL Fantasy Fanatic, Tim Guest, and you can find me on Twitter at Tim Guest AU. You can find me anywhere on any of the social pipes at Tim Guest AU. And just a reminder, if there's a play you want discussed or a question you want answered, Tweet us on the spaces below or comment if you're watching on YouTube and we'll see if we can get through them all before the end of the recording. Well, joining me as always is my co-host and the man who's been smashing out those head-to-head videos with all those other fantasy legends from around the community. It's Bales, mate. Bales, how's it been going? Yeah, good, mate. Uh, just obviously, yeah, smash out those head-to-head videos. Had to get them all recorded. Obviously, I've uh, travelled uh, around with a mate from the US uh, going around to a few uh, different states and stuff, and it's almost a bit of like a fantasy catch up, catch up with a couple of fantasy guys and stuff. Uh, caught up with Shuckers uh, in Sydney, Le- uh, Liam from Free Kick in uh, Melbourne, and uh, and uh, yeah, Ball Boys in Gold Coast, and obviously, uh, I'll obviously see yourself, Tim, in Perth, and all the legends in Perth as we gear up to the start of the season, mate. So going well, and I'm just these, as Liam said to me uh, in, uh, when we we're chatting. It's just this is that time of the year where it's uh, it's just that dead point. There's no cricket, there's no tennis, there's no um, there's no footy, there's no like it's all sports essentially done. Whereas pretty much from next week onwards, we we've got we got sports. So mate, can't wait to get stuck in and chat to a couple of legends tonight and uh, chat through different couple of strategies and talking points. Well, mate, for me that's meant all the more time for me to do my fantasy research. I'm right in the depths of it all right now. But look, we've got a couple of expert guests that we want to bring on and a pretty bloody good reason that we want to bring them on tonight. So firstly, let me introduce the co-founders of the Coaches Panel. Firstly, we've got MJ and secondly, we've got Rids. Boys, welcome to AFL Fantasy Fanatics. Thank you very much. Nice to be chatting to you, boys. And Rids, if you can figure out how to unmute something, it'll be a great contribution to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen. A half-naked pot can't actually just unmute by themselves, mate. So it's all good. No, if you're half-naked, so, MJ, mate, you know that this was music. a prank. This was an absolute prank for you because I wanted you to read out half-naked bots as my handle when I said, <laughs> I don't know what handle I use. <laughs> and this was actually um, Jaden Papowski's idea. So blame him, will you? Well, where does Jayden. it come from? What's it about? Oh, well, it's, it's just that. I was, just, um, um, Bale said, hey, do you want to come join us? And I said, yeah, rightio, what can I do to prank MJ? And MJ is so clean cut, I wanted him to read it out. And, like, I don't know if anyone else is having this problem, but half-naked chicks, bots, like, hitting me up big time, liking, asking to be friends. So I thought that would be appropriate. Wow, mate. <laughs> X is a, a whole new universe now, isn't it, mate? Oh, trust me. Yeah, exactly. I used to have to go to the strippers to actually do get hit on by a robot. But anyways, <laughs> that's another story, Bales. Maybe for you later on, yeah? <laughs> All right, moving on, I think, as I'll quote from one of our other very favourite podcasts. Um, now, boys, a couple of big reasons why we wanted to get you on uh, early in the preseason. Firstly, the end of last year, there was some talk about, I mean, tip, and starting off, obviously, coaches panel, you know, been uh, a brilliant computer, uh, contributor to the fantasy community for a bloody long time now. But um, at the end of last year, you guys talked about doing some more AFL fantasy-specific content coming out this year. So firstly, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what does that all mean for season 2024? That's you, MJ. You're, oh, the, one with, you're the boss, mate. You know what's going on. I have no awesome. idea. You're also the bloke that let it out of the, the bag before we even told what we were doing. But, yeah, no, it's, it, you know, we, one of the things that the coaches panel has done since our inception eight years ago has always been about if you play all formats of, the, of fantasy and you take it on the more serious side of things, um, is to be able to give you strategy, insight and advice. But as the games have evolved, whether it be trades, uh, gameplay, strategy, uh, and then for a while there, it was not just the different scoring, but DPPs in season where in some formats or not, it was really clear to us that the 
advice we were giving was only ever going to be capped because it was a bit more generic and open-ended. And so, yeah, the conversation across the panel over the year was about hey, to be really able to service uh, our listeners well, whether it be new or old listeners as, as a part of the community, be able to go, you know what, let's split up our in-season content, um, especially uh, with the specific content focuses in mind. And so, yeah, that's what we've done. So the 50 most relevant wraps up on Monday. And then from there on in, our, our content starts to move very much into format by format targeted approach. So once the season proper drops, you'll get a weekly AFL fantasy content piece as well as super coach, but then plenty of stuff over the next 20 plus days as well. Oh, it's great to hear, mate. Great to hear. And obviously it's really good for our listeners as well. We've got listeners that, I mean, because we've got the content creators cut because our listeners are kind of made up of, you know, or the guests come from so many different pods as well. We've got listeners across so many different pods. So this is another great example of people or another, you know, channel that they can kind of get onto for more fantasy advice, which is great. And as part of that, um, you know, that's actually that, that bringing up the Content Creators Cup. The other thing that we wanted to kind of uh, uh, announce about the Content Creators Cup for this year is with you guys doing more AFL fantasy specific content, uh, we wanted to actually bring you guys into the AFL uh, fantasy uh, con uh, fanatics Content Creators Cup for uh, season 2024. Um, so obviously uh, MJ and Rids yourselves. Uh, and then uh, Mini Monk will be joining the competition as uh, also a, a critical part of the coaches panel. Yeah, it'd be, that's a great privilege, mate. So thanks for the cheers for the invite. Um, Mini Monk couldn't be here tonight because he's taken his uh, missus overseas to Japan. I reckon it might be even he's proposing, I think. But let's just um, congratulate him anyway, okay, when he gets back this week. <laughs> he's certainly put him under pressure Australia on Monday. <laughs> we can all uh, tweet him when he gets back, mate. Did she say yes? Yeah, just say congratulations. <laughs> it was great. Let's get into it. <laughs> Well, welcome into the comp, boys. Uh, obviously, we got some uh, pretty stiff competition. I mean, obviously, uh, with Mitch and the Ball Boys taking it out last year, um, but it's uh, it's going to be and it, look. I mean, it's uh, it's all, almost a little scary allowing Mini Monk to come into the competition. He might just blow us all away from the way he's been going the last couple of years. But uh, exactly but uh, a saying. great competition, and uh, obviously for a great cause as well. With uh, the winner being able to donate five thousand dollars to their uh, favourite charity. That's a massive, mate. Well done. And, yeah, congrats again for everyone that won last year and everything else. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Well done, Tim, for you, mate. Well done. Oh, yeah, bit of – well, look, it's a bit of fun. We loved it. It uh, certainly got the community going last year, so – no, I wanted to continue Not as this fun year. for me last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll see. It's, this year's a new year, mate. So, yeah. So I'm, everyone's, I'm, everyone's got a fresh slate. Mate, screwed on this year. I'm, I'm, re I'm rearing to go. I need, I need to – for, if I want to have any sort of reputation in this fantasy community, if I go and have another bad year, people are just going to go, oh, Bale's the buy, and, it's, and that's never going to leave me. So well, I need to get rid of that. <laughs> so, don't put yourself under too much pressure, Bales. Let's just see how oh, it goes. Mate, right. I, I always do, mate. Always do. <laughs> anyway, let's get talking about some fantasy, hey? So uh, firstly, MJ, mate, uh, I mean, obviously great work with the, the 50 most relevant every year. I mean, it's a must listen. It's, you know, it's, it's just, you know, one obviously – sit there and listen to uh, each individual player and hear uh, the analysis of, you know, greats of the community. Uh, I, I think we, we probably, most of the community know who number one and number two might be. Let's not give it away. But more what I wanted to ask you, mate, is now that we're kind of a bit closer to the season, who, who do you think missed? Who do you think missed the 50 most relevant? Oh, you know, honestly, like, because we built the list out in December and obviously started in January 1, they, you know, to bring you behind the curtain for a minute, there is some organic movement that does happen of players within the 50, especially early days. But there's a ton of guys that miss. We'll drop an episode um, early next week. So Monday, the number one player gets revealed. Like you said, I think everyone's kind of figured out who the top two are. It's just which is the audience. It might be the big question for some people. Our Patreons have already figured it out, by the way, because they've already listened to the number two episode that came out today. But th there's a couple for me that I reckon, if we're honest, I'd say, yeah, you know what? They kind of missed out. One of those would be a guy called John Newcomb. I, I think he's really unlucky to have missed. You could probably throw uh, a Carl Amon into the mix for that. Super coach, because we factor that in. Someone like a Nat Fife definitely sneaks oh, in the mix. Yeah. Caleb Daniel is kind of the forward premium that everybody's forgotten about this year. But if he's getting some of that McRae role or, or second touch football, like he's really, really important. Uh, Finn McRae... I, 
um, was just doing an episode uh, that we were finishing up uh, talking about uh, one of the last two players in the 50 most relevant with Rince just the other day. And the, the departures that have happened to this Collingwood side don't just benefit a potential premium defender. But, but a Finn McRae could absolutely be one of the best cash cows of the year for us. Um, so th- there's a ton of guys that are really unlucky in this. Um, Nick, Martin, a couple of names. Nick Martin Nick Martin was another one probably as well. No. MJ, what about Elliot Yo, mate? Right yeah. now, what number would he be right now? If I was starting from scratch right now, true story, I'd probably put him in the high 30s to low 20s. High thirties to low twenties. That's yeah. that's different. You you're counting in reverse. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Hi. You, you've learned about my uh, brain IQ fairly fast, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> so for anyone that's listening, I'm actually the brains behind the coaches panel. MJ, I don't think anyone's questioned that ever, mate. <laughs> well, well, MJ's the beauty, right? Especially with that hair. Turn it up. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, that's funny. Um, but yeah, no, just no, obviously with uh, with the fifty most run, I think we'd probably talking through that. We'll probably move into like sort of an, an area that has been spoken about a fair bit. Like the forward line, we we probably won't touch on as much unless we have a few questions later on in the show. But the thing I wanted to touch on was was the ruck. So that's the that's I feel like that's the thing that's sort of been chatted about the last sort of couple of weeks that we with, with the whole cherry sort of with a facial sort of fracture and, and potentially him like missing like time to train that apparently he should be right for the practice games but people looking more a, a max gone and and whatever and, and me and i know mitch from the ball boys is he was probably the first one i really heard that was on this and, and he was saying that he thinks the question more is uh is grundy versus cherry and and gone should be that number one guy there so mj i'll go for you first this one then we'll go to rids um what, what do you, what's your Thinking with the with the Rutlands, I think a lot of people are, are choosing between those three rucks. Is, do you have a favourite two out of those, and and what do you think is probably the the duo that you decide in between who's the lock in your team? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think the beauty of it is each of the incarnations you do. You mentioned those three kind of value options, and and a Marshall and English. Like, let's not discount these guys. These these were fantastic performers for us last year. Whichever combination of the two of the five that you pick drastically reshape the look of your team. Like if you do a Grundy and a Cherry as the most valuable two, well, this creates other opportunities for you to access some of that $900,000 plus assets or add that extra mid-price connection or two. Um, Whereas if you're using one of those big end boys of an English or a Marshall, regardless of who you set with it, of the other three, it really does change everything. So for me, I don't think it's as simple as it's these three guys and which of the two you like. I think it genuinely is a conversation around five. Uh, right now, for me, I'm currently rocking a Grundy and a Cherry for me in my AFL fantasy side at the moment, but could very, very easily be moved into any of those five t- to turning them into two options for me. Yeah, Rids, how, what, are you, what are your thoughts on the whole... The rucks uh, and is is yes is Marshall and, and uh, English being maybe a bit looked over like as uh, MJ was saying a bit there as one well, they've got to probably get to have a conversation about those two. What are your thoughts with the rucks? I think the value is such an important piece in our starting pieces and trying to build that team dollars um, that it sort of pretty much rules out Marshall and English. Not because they're awful and they're not going to score what they're priced at or anything like that. It's just we're looking for a bit of value aren't we really um we're looking at gorn who's um priced at 92 we're looking at grundy priced at 75 and we're looking at cherry priced at 64 now the one thing that i do want to call out here and i heard that um pod the other day that you're referring to bales um and it actually made me think a little bit more about it i'm actually thinking the conversation should be and this is going to be a little bit weird okay it should be cherry and either one of Gorn or Grundy. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because Gorn and Grundy, they're proven, okay? We know what they've done in the history, but there's still question marks around that. A guy like Tristan Cherry is only 24. Of course, he doesn't have the history the, the other two do, but we've sort of shaped it the wrong way. And the other thing with Cherry, okay, it's not just Cherry versus Gorn or Grundy. 
It's the dollars. What does that do for your team? Does that allow Flanders to come in as an F1? Does that, uh, you know, after that news today? Or does that allow you to get an extra rookie off the field or something like that? And that's the important part. It's not just who's going to score more, Gorn versus Cherry. It's who's going to score more, Gorn plus whoever, and then Cherry plus the extra cash that you're spending elsewhere. And that's the conversation I think it really needs to start happening. And I think the way that we pose these questions at time really, really is important to our starting teams. So anyway, so I just wanted to throw that out there because it has been doing my head in, the conversation, because it's the same conversation, yeah? Everyone's saying the same thing. Oh, well, it's Gorn versus, you know, is it Gorndy? Or do we have Cherry? And then it's, is it Cherry and Grundy? Or is it Cherry and Gorn? Just let's reshape that a little bit, that conversation. Is it the best structure? Because we're talking about two guys with a buy, yeah? So even if Gorn goes out and scores way more and it starts hurting you, you've still got that round five or round six score to actually make up again. So that's my thoughts anyway. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I think to echo what uh, MJ said early on as well, like this is, it's it's going to make such a big change to your structure. And really, I think it's got to, you've almost got to allow how you're structuring up to dictate which way you're going. Um, um, you know, I mean, it, it, I mean, certainly uh, you would think that Cherry op- offers the, probably the maximum upside. And then there's also the benefit of not having that buy. Although, I think there's also an argument with mid prices as well that a playing opening round is actually a benefit, um, but particularly if they've got that kind of round five or round six buy because it gives them that double price increase. So, you know, it does mean that you could get off them by that the, by the time they get to their buy. And not that I'm necessarily suggesting you might. I mean, you might want to get off of a Gorn or a Grundy by that time, but I think it probably would be a little bit too early. But um, on the flip side, I mean. You know, we've we've got these kind of close to. I mean, they are underpriced premiums, but uh, close to premiums who do have a buy, which you know we're tending to try and want to stay away from in those first those first kind of opening rounds. Are you playing devil's advocate though? Um, if you do go down to Cherry and it doesn't work out, where do you go? Yeah, that and literally just before we start, I was actually talking to my uh, mate who's a North Melbourne fan. I was just chatting to him about like just uh, like LDU and, and and Cherry and stuff like that. And, and he was saying he's like if he was building his own team, he doesn't play fantasy anymore. He used to, but he would be going Gorn and Grunny just because he's like we, like if you need to go Cherry up if something happens, he's thinking where do you go? And I think the thing I think that a, a big thing that's going to hinge on what's going to happen with our rucks is actually going to be someone like Toby Conway or if Jordan Sweet was to play and Solo wasn't but I, I think that's probably it's by the sounds of like I think Louis's been saying that Solo's been the clear number one ruck and it looks like he's going to be that guy which means that you're probably not paying 387k for a for a bench ruck so it's probably Conway and apparently he trained quite well apparently beat Stanley in the uh, sort of intra club game they had so I think if if he plays it makes the Gorn and Grundy combo Sort of, you've you've probably got a little bit less fears because you have got a guy that's probably going to be there in in round five or six. So, do you, do you boys sort of agree with that with that sentiment? If, if we get a Conway in, that would help. Bales, how confident would you be that Conway is going to be playing in round five or six? Yeah, that's that. Yeah, and that's the other. That's the other part. That's why this discussion really interests me, and that's why uh, it was a uh, good sir. Uh, suggestion by you to be chatting through this because I think there's so, sort of a lot to unpack there. And I think that there is definitely a well with Geelong and not the not quite the most trustworthy when it comes to uh with the teams and what they're gonna do. But uh, I definitely you could definitely see a world where um Conway is is dropped after three weeks and, and they bring Stanley back in. But I, I sort of just look and I'm like Conway so Conway's twenty uh I think I don't know if he's turned twenty one this year. I think it's his third year in the system. Uh and then you look at Stanley's thirty three and it's like it's 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 uh, Geelong go for a premiership, and in that case, they're going to play uh, or go for finals, I should say. And they're going to play uh, Stanley, or are they going for a bit of more of a rebound? They're going to go Conway. So that's what makes it so interesting. But if I was an outside, I'd be playing Conway. But 
I'm obviously yeah. not a Geelong fan, so I'm not yeah, sure what they're going to do. Guys, I d- he's just loose, yeah? I reckon he actually thinks they're going to play finals this year. He reckons he, he's got a good enough list to do it. Like everyone else in the world's going, nah, 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 it might be time to actually rejuvenate the list. But the problem is Chris Scott doesn't believe so. Otherwise, Ken Guthrie wouldn't be the number one mid in that CBA mo- rotation right now. Like... There's things that are pointing at us. Dangerfield would have been retired by now. Like, it's certainly that Geelong just, arrogance, isn't it? They, they, yeah. They seem to often think they're further ahead than where they are. And so what you might find is by round seven or eight, when they actually drop out of that conversation about finals, that's when he might go and rejuvenate the list and give the kids the run and give the Conways and everything. So I, I think- can see a world both ways. I also I want to keep throwing out this, and I, th- I think we've got to be a little bit careful of getting stuck in our old school thinking of fantasy. Like the game is changing, and and we've got to evolve with it. And uh, you know, I keep hearing content creators talk about you know having cover, and it's we don't need cover. It's best eighteen. We don't need cover, and that's it. That's exactly right. That's the greatest point ever, Tim. If you want like Gorn and Grundy, you know what? I can tell you a hundred reasons why they're the right choice, Rodio. But what do you really want? Twenty-two scores on that field in that week that they have a buy to choose your eighteen best scores from. It doesn't really particularly matter unless you get a lot of bullets that week, yeah. So I just I think it's a mute point either way, and I think sometimes we focus too heavy on having the most, and it just doesn't matter really. Yeah, and because and because it's round. Sorry, MJ. Just I'll just quickly say that, and I'll go to you. I was just say because it is round five and six. They've got the buys. By that point, we might have an extra premium, or potentially two, depending on how quickly we get this cash gen from our mid price and rookies. Where we might all of a sudden have twenty twenty one sort of players that we're confident. In. That's regarding if Sheasel, sorry, not Sheasel, McKercher goes well, and and Harley Reid, and and even like some of these guys put up good scores. But that's what's. Might, might make it a bit different. But, yeah, MJ, go on. Yeah, I, I find this point around Cherry that you mentioned, you know, really interesting. We, we look at this ruck that clearly has the greatest financial upside for us in terms of no number one role. Yes, not the proven scoring components of Grundy and Gorn, but people are concerned about the lack of parachutes. I get it. He's the only option. But one of the best things we have at the early start of the season is the opportunity to be aggressive and adventurous with our trades. There's no question marks that Cherry is the number one ruck. Clear and supreme. There is no one else on that list that's anywhere near able to take that spot. So if he fails, guess what? For those that jumped on Cherry 12 months ago, it's the same opportunity that came for you 12 months ago. Two trades. Be aggressive. You now get more data. You get to see something different. And you get to restructure your team off the back of that. So, yeah, don't worry about, oh, I don't have the cover of options of Cherry. That's fine. You're going to have a mid-price guy that's in your team. They're not all going to work out. Statistically, there's only a handful that do. So, yep, you want to go Gorn Grundy, as, as Rids mentioned? No problem at all. Plenty of options. But if value is the thing and trying to maximize dollars generated, Cherry is the one that has the pathway to make you the most amount of money in the first parts of your year. And I just want to highlight one more thing about this. Guess what? The starting squad is the mo- least most important part of the year of your ranking. You know, I'll, I spent a bit of time with Matty Mottram last year. He started with Tristan Cherry, you right. know, round one, and he was top 10 for the majority of last year. So he still saw it as an opportunity. What he did was he turned um, Kelly, who he also got bad luck with in round one, and he turned Cherry into English and then also Tom Green. And so all those months that we spend and we try to make it as important as possible, the starting squad is probably the most irrelevant out of all of it. So, you know, it's just an opportunity. Go and trade. Prove that it's a trading game. Go and get your opportunity and trade your way out of it. So it's all good. Otherwise, if we're worried about what ifs, we're going to be what if this guy doesn't do this? What if this what guy if everyone, doesn't do this? Mate, can't you? 
Actually, it, thinks, it has me think about uh, listen to one of the Holmes's files today uh, on Pod Pod with uh, JD, uh, who you know, kind of ex Super Coach, uh, done well in Super Coach, came across and uh, you know did well in AFL fantasy. And he's, he's kind of echoing what you were saying about being aggressive there, Rid. So uh, yeah, it's 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 um, you know, I must admit I was pretty uh, pretty locked in with Gorn and Grunny there, but I must admit I'm kind of I'm I'm thinking twice now. You, you're that- dead right. He's the, he's definitely the the best uh, cash generation opportunity for sure and and part of me is just like from the uh, like last year and when we saw the positions come out i was like at the time i was like damn it why couldn't just want to go uh, grundy or cherry bin forward it would have been happy but it and i know that uh mj and ridge you boys the boys have even spoken about this exact point on coach pan on a couple of uh, like either head heads or episodes or whatever you've said that's actually it's actually made the game so that it's going to be so much more diverse and that's why that this the three rucks here, it's so such a sort of divisive opinion and people are going one way or the other because it, it makes the game so much more uh, interesting and people got different teams because there's too many times where like the start of the years where people have got probably like, what, maybe 12, 13, 14, 15 players all the same and there's not many. Whereas this year, there's not many, with especially with the forward line being so barren. So I just, yeah, I think it's a, a great discussion point for the preseason. So the other thing I just wanted to highlight was I did um what when was it Zach Fish um Zach Williams um MJ when did I do that about a it week ago? Ten. Yes. Yeah, about a week ago. And I mentioned and I was talking to DT Lemon about it later on, Rodeo. I mentioned that 30 points upside that value adds. Like Tristan Cherry at 64, can you see him averaging 95? Yeah, I definitely can as a sole ruck. Like, I mean, there is the app, like capability of 30 points of upside. Like, that is immense. And if you go through your team and start working out, who are the guys with that 30 points of upside? Like, Zach Williams jumps off the page, yeah? Brody Grundy, priced at 75, jumps off the page. You can see him averaging 105. But Tristan Cherry's just as good as any five hundred thousand dollar player across any of the formats. So, like, it's just across any of the positions. Sorry, it's just a no brainer for me, and I think we're overthinking it at times because of the history. Yeah, and and the point that home, I think Holmes again made this on uh, one. The, I think when they were doing the draft, the pod were doing the draft team is like we'd gone. Is that because I think that uh, they had that discussion with Gorn and and Cherry's that. Gorn being priced at 92, there's a, there's a world where he could go at that 110 and and that 18 points, is, does that potentially sort of counteract that that 30 points of upside for Cherry? And is, is that where maybe Grundy is the one that, if he in opening round, if he has a doesn't have a good game, is that maybe where Grundy all of a sudden becomes a guy that, yeah. that we're not looking at? But the at? problem with that was I heard that one as well and I was like, okay, that's great. Yes, you're not using that cash you've generated from that. Tristan Cherry is the easiest one to jump from, is he not? Otherwise, you're sitting there fighting yourself with a Grundy or a Gorn. Do I keep him? Are they going to get back to 110? Oh, they've got a good run for three or four weeks. I better hold on to them, even though they're averaging 105 or 110. Like, you're just in no man's land because, really, at the end of the day, we all want to get to a Marshall or an English because – they're, they're pretty good, like, and they're coming into their prime. They're not 32 years old trying to get to a final series. And, I mean, that's not been little in anyone, okay? They, Grundy and Gorn are top, top options. It's just I think we're getting a bit caught up in that, you know, I mean, I've seen many conversations around keepers. Yeah, great. But you know what? We're not selecting mid prices to be a keeper we're selecting mid prices to generate cash we're not if you're thinking that a mid pricer is going to be your season long premium you probably need to have a little rethink yeah yeah well, well we're lucky we're lucky if we get one or two um every couple of years that end up being season keepers it was just so happened what a couple of years ago i think it was the year we had Will Brody, James Sicily, and George Hewitt, who are all considerably in like underpriced and in that mid price range, and they all really became sort of those keepers, and 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 that rarely happens. So if if we get someone like it, if it's an Elliot Yo this year who's priced in that mid price range, or if it's a, a Zach Williams, like if he went at ninety five, I don't see it. But if he did or something like that, we might get one if we're lucky. But I think you're right, Rids. I think that a lot of these guys we're going to be happy. They're just there to make the cash put some decent scores up for the first sort of half of the season and then you slowly trade them out of your sides over the first sort of 12, 13 weeks. 
Yeah, look, I, I want to talk about something and uh, kind of leaning on from the mid-price is talking about something that's also been a little bit divisive as well, and that's our defensive line. And um, you know, I think I think if we we kind of I think most of us are leaning towards you know fading forwards, obviously with the, the uncertainty and the the lack of picks that we've kind of got down there. Um, you know, rucks. I think we kind of got you know one or two ways to well, well two ways to kind of go there. But with the defenders, and you know, Jepper, a coach I uh, hugely respect. I really love the man as well. Uh, good, you know, mate of mine, I'd say. Um, you know, he was talking about paying up in the defensive lines. Um, when I'm looking at my team, I've actually kind of gone the other way. I'm actually, I don't see a lot of value in the, in the top end of the defensive lines. I wanted to get an idea from you boys about what you were kind of doing, how your defences look at, at the moment. MJ, what about you, mate? I want to let Rid start on that one because I feel like he wants to come in off a hot run. I, I know where he's going, so I want to give him a minute on that one. And then Go I'll for Rid. on the tail. I think what we do is we overthink things, yeah? So Hayden Young is an absolute lock as anyone in the defensive line, okay? Yeah. So straight away, that's one guy, you know, 800,000, we can lock away now. Tom Stewart with that fixture to start the year, to, for me, in my opinion, and I, I wasn't really um, shy about telling it in the top 50 or whatever it was. I don't know when that was either, MJ, but there was a pod the other day about Tom Stewart that I was on. I pretty much told everyone he's that absolute lock for me. I just don't see a world that he's not going to go pop in the first few weeks with that fixture. I think Elliot Yo's the interesting one, isn't he? Like he's now coming into this um, world where – like, I, uh, let's be honest, yeah. Did anyone really believe he'd be this deep into the preseason without having a calf or a hammy or something go wrong? But the thing is, that practice game or the sim today, he was walking off. He was full of beans. He looks as fit as a fiddle. I reckon we just got to forget the injury prone stuff now and we just got to deal with him now. We're going to start him or we're not going to start with him. Whichever way you go about it, it's up to you. But there's three straight away. I think Zach Williams is the easiest selection in the defence line this year. And I know he's got an early buy, but I think him and Young are just an absolute lay-down mazares, yeah? So there's your five straight away. So it's only really, do we have Yo at D3 or do we have Yo at D4? And that's going to come down to what's your cash on the other lines? Where are you going to fit? Because Offield, Paul, Curtin, they're all going to be around that D6 mark anyway, then D7. So I think it's only really one spot that's up for grabs in the defensive line in my eyes. And MJ, you probably got a different view to me. It's D2, D3. Like, no matter how you want to do it, but they're the ones that I see a lot, okay? MJ, do you share your views? Yeah, or I, no? I, I totally agree. Um, and, and I think what you're really hedging towards is a conversation around Nick Dacos. T to me, that, I think, is the elephant in the room. I am, Johnny. Um, uh, you think yes. Nick Dacos is going to be in the last two of the top 50? Uh, he is more likely to be in the top two than Matt Crouch. Okay, we should stay away <laughs> from Nick Dacos, Rodeo. So just just to keep people interested, just in case, because I think me and you spent about an hour talking about him today, just out of interest. Yeah, I wonder if that was for number two or number one. That's the question, though. Mm. But, but we are hedging our bets here because that's the one. I think the injury to blank, we, the, the stats for and of with without for Sicily, we know that's fairly strongly clear indicated. I think a lot of people that were bullish on Sicily will likely fade some interest, at least for now. You can throw Sinclair into the mix, but with some lack of pre-season opportunities, again, I can see a world where people are, are losing interest. And, Tim, you mentioned about this idea of can you or should you pay up for a player? I, I think we're all kind of alluding to a Nick Dacos. The answer, I think, is he could be one of, if not the most divisive and relevant decisions you make because there is a world where if you select him, there is the sleep easy factor and there's a one nervous week in the first five weeks. And then if you are fading him, you are one nervous owner, especially in rounds two and three where he plays Brisbane and St Kilda and he's got a beautiful VC matchup early on and all it takes is him to get you a 90 against McGuinness, which is well and truly within his scope and scope of doing. 
and all of a sudden now you're going, man, for the risk of saving fifty thousand dollars, I'm now paying up nine hundred and fifty thousand or even a million dollars to try to find a way to squeeze him in. And no longer am I chasing value, I'm chasing the pack because I think there's a website called Bit in that that has him and Rids. You might be able to check uh, even Mini Monk or Jordox or see yeah. the guys that are on it. I think he's like seventy percent of active coaches right now own him. Seventy point four eight adjusted current ownership number. Yeah, so and, that's and huge. That's what, and that's and again because I've been off Dacos for for the whole preseason. I just think that the whole with the Finn McGuinness and oh, he's got Sydney in round one. I know Ryan Clark's not there, but uh, I think that another person like a road bottom can do a particularly good job on someone like a Dacos. Whether again, whether he stops into a, a, a below seventy score or whether he goes a an eighty five ninety. But MJ, it's a good point you you raised. If he does go that. Sort of, even if it is just, an, even if it's an eighty plus against McGuinness, then all of a sudden the arguments that sort of a lot of us have said about not starting Dacos because he's too expensive and he's got that tag, all of a sudden become null and void, and we're all going to be scrambling at that point to try and find her. Because I think a lot of people are looking at someone particularly like an Elliot Yo, if if uh, he gets to around six, seven, eight, and and we're sort of comfortable maybe trading him at that point, if uh, if we're sort of a bit nervous with him and. It could be a move from him to Dacos, but you might need 250K at that point, even still, because Dacos could still, like, he could just, again, just pump out these scores and we just can't get to him. So, and I think that we did this with Doherty last year, and a lot of us were thinking that Doherty was clear and, and away the best defender um, that we could pick in the in the preseason. And I know it didn't actually work out, but a lot of us went that way. And and you guys obviously talk about the group think, and the group think last season was go for the number one defender because he's clearing away the best bit, whereas the group think this year is Dacos is going to get tagged, he's too expensive, we can't start him. But it's just, he's essentially the exact same price as what Doherty was last year and we didn't have any problems. And with the opening with the opening buy as well, that's another factor that, that works in. So he's, the, the, doors, the doors just open ajar for, the, for, the, for Dacos for me, but I'm still currently on the side of not starting. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. But, Tim, were you going to say something there as well? Uh, I wasn't, but I will. I just, I, don't, I mean, <laughs> so I think, he, I mean, he's, he comes in an average of 109, uh, break even 109. Um, I'm just not sure that he's going to hurt us that much, that he's going to get, you know, too far away. I mean, even even with the, the way the, the rookies impact the magic number, um, I mean, you would normally see a, a player that's kind of needs to do a 109 would probably need to score around about a 113, 114, something along those lines to hold his price. As an average, um, and I mean, I, I mean, you know, maybe he can do, you know, a doc a one twenty season or something along those lines. But even if he's averaging that, I'm just, I'm not. I mean, that's, you know, that kind of five to seven points is is not going to get away from us too much. Um, so for what it's worth, in the six games that he had sixty five percent center bounces or more, he averaged over one hundred and fifteen in AFL fantasy. That will hold his price quote. Just yeah. the thought. And that's very attainable for a Nick Dacos. And I'm going to throw another thought out there. We all know Jaden and the work that Jaden's done. He's done a bit of um, work with worthwhile averages. You know, Nick Dacos is only really needing 111.6 using that formula that Jaden's provided to be a worthwhile buy adjusted average for us. And I can see him going 110 every day of the week. So I know he's not there for the money generation, but that's that's one of those um, caveats, yeah? Sometimes the trade saved going a guy like this is going to counteract, like trying to find a way to get him in. So but, but we'll just say like, to, so, But based on what we were kind of talking about before, right, we were talking about early on be aggressive. Would you yeah. say that Dacos, though, is an aggressive pick or a safe pick? I would say based on that, you would call him a safe pick, right? Like I if you wanted that you. safe person. So for me, that's why I'm kind of I'm leaning away from it. I, so I want to take a little bit more of an aggressive approach, especially with the value that's available. I mean, even with, you know, we've even got players like your, your Marcus Windhagers, we've got your Jordan Clarks, um, you know, we talked about your Caulfields and your Marty Hawes. Um, like I just think there's some more value options available down there, um, which might give you a better opportunity in terms of, you know, being able to drive home a car. I 100% agree with you. But let's not forget, we were just talking about Gorm just a minute ago, yeah? Like, 
we're saying, well, let's be aggressive with um, going a cherry. But Nick Dacos, it's those guys with that ceiling. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And he hurt us last year. We ownership. all wish we bloody had him last year, didn't we? When we did yeah, it, when we faded and that him. high ownership, mate. And I can tell you now, okay, this is recorded, isn't it, Bales? Yes, it is. So let's hope that Dacos doesn't go 120 over the first five weeks and Tim has to listen to him say... Oh, <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time, mate. Wouldn't be the first time I've uh, completely <laughs> messed it all up. Yeah, but, I mean, that's why I'm sort of like... I'm sitting on the fence with this one because I'm really torn and this is one of those big decisions, yeah? And and let's not forget, and, I mean, I don't want to steal the thunder off the top 50 and whatever else that we came up with, there is a Tay Adams hole that needs to be filled, you know. How does that get filled? Like, and I won't tell you how, but there is a world that Nick Dacos is easily covered by starting your team as well. So, I mean, I just don't know. I'm so torn on this one. Know, I'm this, with you. And these are the these are the things that we got. And and, and there's probably no right answer anyway, either, right? There'll, there'll be coaches that go one way and coaches that go the other way that still end up doing well and end up with hats. So, uh, you know, it's it's not the, the it's not the consequence of one decision that you make that results exactly. in uh, the end of the year, right? It's it's lots of decisions and, um, you know, and then there can even be little things as well where you forget to put a bloody E on or you forget to do a loophole or some shit like that. And you, yeah, you do a you know, monk thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I did the hey, same um, thing last year as well. Um, what it does emphasise, okay, this discussion is, you better bloody get option B and C and D right because option A could really come and bite you on the ass. Yeah, and that's that's what I do like about, you know, whether or not you you agree with, you know, what any of us have said today with regards to Gorn and Grundy and, and Cherry. Like I think that's that's the, the conversation that you, you want to be kind of or doing in your analysis is what what are you what are what are you gonna do if things go wrong? Um and you know we've also got to got to kind of mitigate a little bit, bit of risk as well in those early early rounds when you're doing your fix-up trades. You know, if too many things go wrong, um, it's season over. Yeah, and you, you can get with- so aggressive that you go off the cliff. And sometimes yeah. you do need something to anchor your team to enable the aggressive manoeuvres. And I think that's where people that like that kind of Gorn and Grundy, they feel, okay, it's, we know that we're missing that cherry upside, but I'm feeling just – it's a little bit – it feels like the old days of set and forget almost, right? We feel a little bit more solid in those choices. The other thing I wanted to highlight just with Dacos is who who do you prioritise? Is it a Dacos after his buy? Is it a Zach Merritt, for instance, who runs into a nice one? Who's the defender you're looking for? Now we've got Sinclair out. They've all got reasonably decent buys, you know. We've got the pies, the – Bulldogs, the Hawks, Richmond, so short. Like, is it like Sicily? Who knows where we're going to go with this in round 15, yeah? So it, it, it's going to be a headache no matter how you do this as you move forward. Yeah. yeah. And with the and with the forwards as well, like being so so barren, and, and a lot of us have said that we're probably going to be using a few of those early trades at least on those forwards to try and get on the guys that are going to make the cash, or if there's no one maybe going up to a if it's a Caleb Daniel or Flanders or if McRae's back and going well, jumping on him. And then if Tom Green comes off his bye, what if Kadeen Coleman goes bangs? Walsh as well coming off the bye. Uh, and if you didn't get Flanders and he's going big sets, so if you get all those to, that come up, then it's almost how you're going to get Dacos. That's sort of the, the one sort That's of thing. That's the conversation, Bones. Yeah. Like how yeah. are you going to get that money to get everyone? Yeah. Like, we can all try and plan for this, but then we get the odd bullet as well. And then we're screwed, yeah? Yeah. We have to sit there and watch him for the next three rounds. Well, we've mentioned Flanders a couple of times, so I think we should uh, – we haven't talked about the comments from today. So I think we yeah. should uh, let everyone know what, what was said today. Yeah, so um, I've got the quote just up here. So I'll, I can just read it out for everyone. If anyone has um, sort of missed it, this was a quote that came out from – from Damien Hardwick, I can't, I can't. It doesn't say if it was today or if it was yesterday, but it was. It's definitely been within the last uh, forty-eight hours in terms of it. And I don't think I've actually heard a better quote in terms of regarding a, a player's fancy value. So this is the exact quote here. So Damien Hardwick said about Flanders. He said, "I think this guy is going to take the AFL world a little bit by storm. 
I looked at him toward the back end of the year once I became interested in the son's job and I couldn't believe the talent that this boy's got. His capacity to run, he's a really good user of the ball, he's incredibly smart and I think he'll reach the potential this club invested in him. He's only going to get better. For all those people who play super coach, and obviously in, in our case, um, sort of play AFL fantasy out there, again, get this kid in your side. We're going to feed him as much as we can. So that's for <laughs> me. Like, I, I don't think I've ever seen a quote that's been more, like, I don't think I've ever put a player as quick in my side after seeing one quote than I did. I've been, I know Mini Monk, I chatted with him after a head-to-head video. We chatted about the this run that, that Flanders has got, like the, the awful grounds and, and a few so sort of difficult opponents. But that was – I was more looking at that from if he's playing a high, high half forward going into the midfield as that fourth guy. But that sounds to me like he's going to be one of those real key cogs in there and that could be 60-plus percent. And and with McRae having an injury in the preseason, we're, we're a bit sceptical of him and, and a few people even sceptical, even if he was fit of him getting back in that midfield. Caleb Daniel, we sort of are people nervous about the Ballarat game and, and not sure how he's going to go. Dustin Martin's got a bye. Dylan Moore just got, has got Ganger fever. So obviously best wishes for him is recovery. And we don't, we didn't really know exactly what role he was going to definitely be playing. And, and there's a lot of question marks of other guys. And that sort of almost makes Flanders that guy that we might be a bit more sure. And so um, also Tim, I'll go for you and I'll go sort of with you three guys. Is that, has that changed your thoughts on Flanders? If, if you were against or, with him, or if that is that just reiterate your thoughts if you were on him? What, what are your thoughts on him? After oh, look, man, I mean, well, firstly, like you, you couldn't get any better quote in the world. I mean, especially a fantasy coach, right? I, 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 the first thing I asked you is, have you fact checked that? That doesn't sound like a real quote. Um, yeah. did Damien Hunt would really say that, but uh, oh, look, it sounds great, it hasn't changed anything for me. I'm not going to be bringing him in, into my side. Um, um, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't. Um, I don't want the early the early buy for my for my premium picks. So uh, especially especially those kind of uh, first couple of rounds. Yeah, and and I guess it makes it interesting if those mid prices like your Jordan and your Billings and and even at Adams to extend as well. If they start going pop, then you you might not be able to start all of them. MJ, what what were your thoughts on Flanders? Obviously, I was listening to the episode with you and Stevie Fizz, and you guys were saying you're probably on the side of of fading him just because that early buy and probably a bit of the roll on Sydney. But after hearing that quote, has that potentially changed your your view? And are you maybe a bit more keen on him after that? It, to be honest, it doesn't change my view around his role. I was always quite certain that Flanders would play a, a split role. You can argue about the percentage of whether it's 35, 40, 45, 50% of mid and forward. He's always, to me, was always going to be fourth fiddle behind a Rao, Anderson and a Took. So nothing of what I heard from that quote from Dimmer changed anything for me in that regard. Because um, to me, the thing that really is the key to the scoring that unlocks Flanders scoring last year is marks. He averaged 5.7 marks over that 10 stretch last year, um, where he did really, really well. And yes, we're talking about this potential evolution of a Damien coached team. But historically, they've always been about high speed of ball movement and surge and marks is you know not a high priority of high possession rate through there. So for me, I, I, he's absolutely still someone I'm prepared to consider, but I want to watch an opening round, and that's the beauty of opening round, is we get a look and see. I don't just want to see... I, I also want to see um, what this game style and any potential evolution of what it looks like. Yeah, no, exactly right. And it's, it's, it's what makes it so interesting. I've... He's in there now, and, and I'll watch preseason and see how he goes. And as I said, with those those mid prices start going well, then that might sort of I might not be able. To, you, you can't have five guys have all got these early buys. I don't think uh, in your forward line. But Rids is what? What are your thoughts on Flanders? Has, has it changed anything for you, or are you still the same? Okay, can I ask a question? Can am I allowed to swear on this pod? <laughs> yeah, it'd, it'd be extra ending for me. But go ahead. <laughs> now, you know what? The first thing it raises for me is how the fuck would Hardwick know how what scores well and what doesn't in Supercoach in the first <laughs> instant? Like, seriously, no one has a clue. Did you see what Jaden did the other week? He gave, went and did all the stats. It was as long – he went from here to Melbourne and back. Like, it was crazy. Who would know? That's special source. So, anyways, I, I don't know. It's just a watch, yeah? Wasn't it always just a watch with opening round anyway? Like, I think we overthink things at times. Um, it's just a watch. Have a play around now. See what it looks like if you have Flanders. See what it looks like if you don't have Flanders. 
and then just wait for open in round is my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I know. I agree. I, I'm just, I just, I like getting on some hype train and stuff. So I was like, yeah, get him in the side because I uh, heard the quote. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's a definitely, uh, he's definitely back on my sort of watch list because uh, he sort of, he was on the watch list, but he was not, I wasn't as keen on him. But sort of that sort of it just hurt my interest a little bit more. So, um, but yeah, no, it's definitely an interesting discussion. And I think, and a lot of people are on Flanders now, it's going to be interesting to see if that ownership increases over the next few days. I think his ownership was currently, I think it was just under 30, 36 or 37 percent. It was somewhere around that mark. I'm just getting the current ownership of him here. So his current ownership is 36.83, so yeah, just under 37 percent. So we're interested to see if that creeps up anymore. But, uh, but yeah, um, Tim, I reckon we let's can, move on uh, with some make, questions. Yeah. Sweet, and sorry. for those uh, listening, oh, whether it's on YouTube or on X, I should say now, I think I said Twitter earlier, if you want to send your questions through, we'll see if we can get them answered before we finish up tonight. But, Bales, have you got a couple of questions there on YouTube and I can jump in on some of the ones we've got on X? Uh, yep. So I'll, I'll start with this one from Blaze just because we, we were sort of just talking about Mac, uh, Mac, uh, sorry, Flanders there and it brings McRae in here and, and he was saying, I think, Tim, you were saying uh, a little bit this, to this uh, to me on the phone, sort of off air. But uh, uh, Blaze said, thoughts on fading Jack McRae and Flanders to start the season and replacing them with mid-priced options like Con McDonald, for example. So, MJ, is that is that the potentially the play? Do we fade all of the guys like McRae, Flanders, Caleb Daniel, all those guys, and just go for these mid-priced guys and, and maybe pay up in the midfield or, or potentially defence, or, as we said with Gorn and Grundy? Do you think that's a... A play, or would you do you like having one of those forwards sort of almost locked in for your F one? Uh, unless you're really bullish that those guys are going to go ninety five plus, for me, then I think this is absolutely a play where you can now really be aggressive with your value options. You mentioned a a, a C Mac, a Connor McDonald. You've got a Fife. You've got a Rochelle. You've got a Fisher that's rolling through there. Like arguably, we've got seven or eight great options between sort of 450,000 and 650,000, 700,000 if you want to go up as high as a, a Taylor Adams. So to me, unless you're bullish that those names that you mentioned, that yeah, they're 95 plus, I'd go the exact opposite way and hunt the value. And if that means all of a sudden you secure some anchors in other lines, go for it. Personally, for me, I don't have anyone over 700,000 in my starting squad um, inside that forward line. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's, and again, another one of those interesting uh, discussions. And I know Tim, you've been um, sort of like that most of the preseason. You've been off of the top price guys. You'd be going for those sort of the cheaper guys under seven hundred k. And there's and there's so many. And and again, if if we see a few of these guys like your Jordan Billings, um, like even a Finlay McRae's a rookie, but a lot of people, if he goes well round one, they're gonna sorry opening round, they're gonna play him on field and. That's another position. Is so many guys. So it's, yeah, it's it's going to be definitely a one that we probably is more assessed post opening uh, opening round. But yeah, it's a good discussion nonetheless. There, um, Simon Sats has got next one here. Uh, age old question, but can you have too many players from one team? E.g., Brayshaw, Young, Fife, and Jordan Clark, uh, or all of the Hawks boys. So Ridge, is is there a do you have a cap on? How many, or again, does it just come down to that where the value is in terms of the team? If all guys present value, you'd be happy to start them. No, nah, it's definitely about the value. I don't put a cap on it. Why? Why? It triggers me when I have two guys that are premiums on the same line, though. I don't know about you guys. Have you ever done a Butters and Rosie on the midfield? It just triggers me. Like, it's like, yuck, I can't do that. That's so, what I'm doing this year, Reds. Huh? That's what I'm doing this year. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's it's an option. But, um, yeah, yeah that, that triggers me. But, yeah, there shouldn't be any rules with that. Yeah, yeah, again, I agree with the, yeah. I guess if with, if they're opening round by players, you probably don't want to have four or five from the same team. But, yeah, as you said, I think it's just it is completely where the value is. And, and yeah, um, Ben Hawkey says, uh, thoughts on starting Marshall as a loop option um, with uh, Harry Barnett, who obviously uh, we had Fry talking about as that guy that would probably be the good R3 uh, loop over a Max Heath. Um, so uh, he's got two questions. So I'll go, uh, so Tim, for the first one, for you, what? So it, is is it, we obviously talked about Marshall before, but are you, is it just fading Marshall and you're not really worried about the loop? You just have what Grundy or Gorn is your loop, I'd imagine. Yeah, look, I mean, um, I'm not sure. I mean, one of the other things to think about is obviously we want to be maximizing cash gen 
we got those buyers early, so I'm not sure that we're, you know, I'm really kind of tossing up this whole like having a non-playing player, right, uh, with a, like it's a loop. You know, we are looking at people like Conway, people like um, Sweet for cash gen. You know, I don't normally like having those players on the bench, you know, over $300,000, but I think this year we probably can look at it. Um, I just, and I also think when it comes to Marshall, there's just, you know, particularly the discussion we had earlier today, there's just too much value in terms of, you know, you Gorn, your Grundy and your Cherry. Um, I mean, I think uh, Marshall is, is, is a bloody good option. He might even have some value himself, but um, I think there's just too much value to ignore in those other three to be starting a, starting a, a Marshall. Yep. I agree with that one as well. Um, Oliver Bartell asked this one, uh, Sarong or Brayshaw, MJ, I know that you're a big Brayshaw man, so I'll go to Rids uh, for this one. Rids, are you, are you Brayshaw or Sarong there? Can I go neither? Oh, neither. Really? Yep. There you go. How, how come you don't like Brayshaw and Sarong? Well... Um... I just don't know what they're going to do. Fife's already – there's been a lot of chat about Fife in the midfield, yeah? Yep. Yeah. There's also Hayden Young going into the midfield. Johnson has spent times in the CBAs over the start of the year. Like, it's got to be a very tight mid-rotation. And I just don't know if there's enough points to see 10 points upside on Sarong or, like, um, Brayshaw at the moment. So – like, I mean, if you had to put a gun to my head, I'd choose Brayshaw, but, yeah, I'd go neither. Okay. Yep, yep. No, cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah I've would yeah, i got currently Brayshaw. I know that uh, MJ has also been keen on Brayshaw as well. I think, Tim, I think you're also uh, keen yeah, on Brayshaw. Okay, but, but, that, but, no, but, yeah, the talk of Fife and that has definitely made me sort of think a bit about uh, Brayshaw and, uh, yeah, and I've got a certain other player uh, next to him at M2. Um what have we got here? So James, uh, James obviously Shuckers has got this one, and and uh, I know exactly why he asked me this one because we had this chat as well. Um, he said talk about butters, and I think he more means uh, butters versus Rosie. So MJ, I go to you for this one. What what are your thoughts with uh, butters and Rosie and the discussion between the two? Can, can you, are you would you be picking? Uh, one, both, neither. Where do you sit on oh, those two guys? Oh, look, I don't know. If you can go both. I, th I think one's strong. To me, Butters is probably the one um, that offers you a couple of different things that Rosie doesn't. One is it offers you another 50-odd thousand dollars that you can do some stuff with. Second, he offers you a comparable level of ceiling. Um, and three, um, he enables you to also not be as enriched in the pick so that, you know, at under $900,000, there is this psychosomatic thing where if all of a sudden it doesn't work out in the way you expect you can be a bit more aggressive with the trade in that point whereas that kind of 950 960 price point that rosie is you do fall into this old school mindset of he's my keeper for the year and i've got him for the buyers and i'm going to roll him through so to me you can do both you can do neither i feel like you're probably letting a gift horse in butters um, go a little bit. So I'd pick butters over Rosie for ceiling and for value. Um, but if I was picking someone that, you know, year week in, week out, I was safer getting 100 out of. Connor Rosie, I think it was 13 out of the last 14 games last year, gave you a ton. So I, I like the ceiling of butters. I'll go butters. Make that after 50K makes a difference for you too. You know yeah. what? Can I jump in here, Bales? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. I just talked about it a minute ago, but if you don't see there being much points difference between Rosie and Butters, yeah, you might say 50,000, but, I mean, there's 10% ownership on Rosie and there's 40% ownership for Butters right now. I'd probably be leaning to the 10% on Rosie if that's the case. Yeah, and, and it's funny because I remember when I had originally had uh, – uh, was it uh, when uh, Mini Monk, when we were chatting about uh, Butters and Rosie on the on the head to head videos, and and at that point, Butters was only I think around that ten percent owned. I think Rosie might have been twelve percent, but Butters has been that guy. And I know Mini Monk did a post about that. Like these players that of the last few weeks have been, they've gone in a week from like ten percent to twenty five percent or five percent to twenty percent. It's like Butters was that guy a couple of weeks ago that just his ownership spiked and. And I won't give away Shucker's secrets. He told me a few things, and it certainly definitely got me uh, thinking more about Rosie and, and Butters. I've still got Butters in my side currently at the moment, but uh, I have sort of had both in there, like all sort of gone one or the other um, at times. So it's a, yeah, definitely a very interesting uh, one between, and between I know, the two players. 
I just wanted to say, I know that MJ and I talk about it all the time on Pods Radio. Picking real points of difference is the key, yeah? So that way then, if you think Butters is risky, like with anything, he's a bit of a kamikaze, yeah, at the ball, and he does put his head down, he's got that running style, then someone like a Rosie could be the way that you feel more comfortable if you want to play it that way. Yeah. Um, this one here from Sim is – I had the, this was a dirty thought that I had. I mentioned it. To, I remember mentioning it to Warney when we chatted about the head to head with Grundy and Cherry, but I don't think you could do this. I just thought I'd bring it in here and see if, if, if we'd get shut down straight away. But Sim asked this one Is running all four rucks with Gorn, Grundy, Cherry, and Sweet too much to spend? Um, allows to cover all bases and turf the other one if uh, one uh, craps the bed. So obviously that would be Grundy. Gorn as your two, Cherry at R3 and Sweet R4. I would think that is too much to spend. I, I've had a thought of if you could go Cherry at R3, if I just had a spare 200K to just put on top and maybe you could do something and trade one out the other. But are we all just – is it just against that thought of – is that just just not even in the realm possibility of doing that? Well, yeah, well if you're going to have someone over that price, you might as well put them on the field and take their points, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my exact thinking as well. It's different if you got like a Conway at R three if you want to part for him. Or if Sweet happened to get that number one ruck, if something happened to Soldo, but I think Cherry's probably too, it's too expensive to have him on the field. So, um, but there you go. Uh, another one here we got from Dimmy says, uh, "Do you fellas think Newcomb can push his ninety three average up to into the one hundred five? No day for one to three weeks. He's assuming uh, LDU a bit more." Um, and his early run is questionable. So, uh, MJ, what are your thoughts with John Newcomb and sort of also could bring LDU into that that point? Who would you probably rather out of those two guys? Oh, look, if it's out of that too, I'd probably take LDU um, over Newcomb. I think there's a few more scoring pathways that I feel more comfortable with. I also can't really say that a guy I put in the 50 most relevant and someone I missed out that I'd now prefer. So maybe I'm doubling <laughs> down on something there. But look, for me, I, I see a world where you can comfortably goes to a 100, no problem at all. 105 is definitely his ceiling, whereas I, I can see a world where an LDU, when fit, we know he is a floor 105 guy uh, as a midfielder. So for me, I, I feel a little bit more comfortable than that. But, boys, i got to bounce. I'll leave you with Ritz to do the 10-minute spiel about signing yep. up to the Patreon yeah, uh, cool. and also yeah. tell you about the, the social media handles. <laughs> Cheers, MJ. Uh, cool, MJ. Uh, I think uh, Louis said it as well on uh, the recent Head Ted video that he did with you, but uh, I think everyone can get around it. Thank you, obviously, for all the hard work that you do, obviously, with the 50 most relevant and obviously with all the content with the coach playing you do throughout the year. It's obviously one of the... Great series going around there and, and all the hard uh, work you do is, is definitely, uh, as Louis literally So I couldn't say it any better, so I'm just going to say to you what I said. It doesn't go unnoticed, mate. So thank you very much for all the work you do, mate. And, uh, yeah, we'll, I'm sure we'll chat to you again at some point throughout the season. Pleasure, mate. Looking forward to it. Love uh, you blokes for what you're doing. And, um, yeah, excited for the year ahead. Perfect. Thanks, MJ. Beautiful. We'll just go through a couple more questions here and then we'll uh, wrap up the uh, special tour space on the Saturday night. But, yeah, so... Um, what have we got here? Uh, the net, we got a couple more questions. I'll go here. So, um, so I like this one here. So, uh, Tim, I'll ask you this one. So, James Crab on YouTube says, "Is a forward line of Connor McDonald, Zach Fisher, Nat Fife, uh, James Jordan, Finlay McRae, and Harley Reid? Is that too cheap? Because that's a little bit similar to what you've gone down. So, do you, if you're doing that, do you think Adams has got to be there, or, or don't you mind having?" all those riskier plays in your forward line. What are your thoughts? No, I don't mind. I think what a little bit like the conversation we were having earlier, I mean, parachutes or, you know, where are you going to go if things go wrong? Um, you know, I think there is room to have maybe a couple of those kind of $600,000 players, i.e. your Taylor Adams, your Zach Fishers, um, your Conor McDonald's. I mean, I think the thing with C-Mac is we just got to wait to see what his role is. Um, and, you know, I mean, the other question is then what happens when Day comes back as well? Um, but so, but I don't think you'd want to go all three because then you might, you know, spread yourself a little bit too thin. Um, I mean, this is what I'm kind of looking at. I've got a couple of players in that six hundred thousand dollar mark. I've got a couple of oh, no, is it one player in that four hundred thousand dollar mark? Maybe I might look at two of like a Nat Five for James Jordan. Um, you know, but once again, I think you want to give yourself um, some room to move if they don't work out. Like, I mean, you know, we, we know that uh, Five has uh, got a bit of an injury history on it. There's a bit of a concern about. Um, sub risk, which he certainly is, but um, 
you know, I, I also tend to feel that they might just kind of throw him in there and, you know, um, see what they, see what's going to happen. Um, a bit like what they're kind of doing with Elliot Yo over at West Coast. So, um, and then, you know, certainly uh, Finn McRae, I mean, looks like there's more and more certainty in his role um, through some of those kind of practice matches. Um, Harley Reid, I mean, he's got to be a lock. Um, and I, I even think there's potential to maybe have even like a really low scoring rookie in that F6. Like, a, you know, I don't think we need to be afraid of like a, a forward rookie that scores only a 50 or a, maybe even a 45. I mean, that's, you know, if it's a $200,000, that's 20 points upside. That's, you know, that's not nothing to um, complain about. But, you know, I mean, there's a few options in there, but we've got to be careful of subs like with your Nick Watsons and your Dersmas and your um, players like that. But, you know, that that I think there's definitely, definitely a play to go cheap in the forward line. And and, that, and, to, and I like the point you raise as well with the fact that, like, for example, like if Darcy Jones was to come in for Giants and play midfield, if Sean Manor got a good role, we know that he's he's got a good uh, scoring pedigree at VFL level, where that translates to AFL after seeing a few other rookie forward rookies. But, like, if, if you look at it, you could have someone let's let's use like Colin McDonald, for example. We we think he's gonna average somewhere around that eighty odd mark. He could obviously go seventy five, we could go eighty five, ninety, we don't know. But you could have him and say a Jeremy Sharp, because I think Sens and McCurch are locked on efforts, or you could have a Sean Manor, for example, on field, but then you could have a Matt Crouch on field. Like that's that could be something that like if you're looking at that, then that becomes, as you say, it's a bit more like people look at the bad probably Sharp's probably gonna score more than a than a manner, uh, maybe, but when you look at it, Crouch is going to, you'd think maybe goes better than McDonald's. So that's where it becomes uh, interesting. So yeah, I, I definitely think it's a, it's a play. And I think, again, it will be, I think a lot of that will be a, a one that's answered post uh, opening round because that'll be when a lot of those mid price guys have played. Um, I'll go the final two questions here. So uh, Rids, I'll go for you for this one here. So Sneeko's got this one He's on YouTube. He says, have a structural question. Uh, thinking about three defender premiums and five midfield premiums, Instead of having the two defender premiums and six midfield premiums, what what are the pros and cons to both structures in, in your eyes? So it's the three defensive premiums versus what the four was it? Uh, oh yeah, so three defenders and uh, five midfielders compared to two defenders and uh, six midfielders. I'd probably lean towards the second option. I I just don't I don't know. With this much value in the teams this year, I just don't like three rookies on the field in the midfield because that's where the points are. You could still have one of them sitting as M9. So, I mean, you could still get the cash generation out of all three of the rookies, but having all three on the field doesn't really fill me with confidence. Yeah. Well, I've kind of got through. So you, have you got two rookies on your field at the, at the moment? One. Oh, wow, one. There you go. That's, there you go. Um, Tim, if, what, how many rookies have you got in the midfield? You're on mute, mate. Oh, no, sorry about that. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, there sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, I think this all comes down to Jeremy Sharp. Um, I mean, I think we're, well, I think for most people, a bit, bit, um, I think that's why we're a little bit shocked about what Rid said, but I think most people have got McKercher and Riley Sanders, um, you know, as rookies in their midfield. Um, but you know, normally that structure in the midfield is dictated by the rookies. You know, if a Jeremy Sharp is playing, you know, I'm priced at 35. If he's got that wing role, you know, he could be scoring 70s. Um, you know, you just can't – I, I just don't think you can avoid that value and you can't afford to have that sitting on the bench. So, um, you know, it, I think it's just going to come down to how locked into that role he is come uh, round one. Yep. Yep, I agree with that one. And um, I think that that will probably do us uh, for now. A couple other questions. Apologies we didn't get to all of the questions. A lot of questions tonight. So, uh, as always, we appreciate uh, you sending all the questions through. But, Tim, mate, over to you to uh, wrap us all up, mate. Well, Rids, why don't you do your 10-minute spiel about the Patreon, according to MJ? <laughs> yeah, then. I'd Apparently, there's a Patreon site, but I'm sure if you just tweet MJ, he'll tell you all about it because I've never used it, so I don't know. So. Well, I mean, look, obviously, let's just for the listeners, I mean, I'm sure everyone's heard of the coaches panel. You want to give them a follow, obviously. They did great work, most 50 most relevant, you know, one of the best series that comes out this year. 
you know, and as we get closer to the uh, the season proper, as you start, you know, narrowing it down to individual players, you definitely want to go back and either listen to the podcast. Uh, the other thing that I often do as well is I, I often go to uh, Coaches Panel TV, uh, Coaches Panel dot TV, I should say, um, and sometimes read the articles rather than listening to them. Um, sometimes I just find it a bit easier and a bit quicker to access the information that I want to see. Um, and, of course, you know, one of the benefits is you can sign up to any one of their levels of Patreon, which gives you access to content and early and, you know, all other sorts of features. And uh, I think to- at the premium level, Tim, you get, like, pictures of MJ's hair, like in different <laughs> styles and shit like that. So, so that might be worth throwing a few extra bucks there the There you Patreon. go. Why not, mate? Why not? For the best hair in fantasy football. But, Rids, why don't you uh, let us know, mate, uh, where the people can find you? Uh, at half naked bots. <laughs> CP. <laughs> oh, that's, 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 there we go. Yeah, um, and the, the thing is, MJ left, so he didn't have to say that. That's that's, that's probably what it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, look to everyone that's sending questions. Thanks for thanks for sending them in, and of course for all of you who joined us listening live. Thank you. Uh, please make sure you send your questions to us on X or uh, yeah, certainly give us a follow on X as well. Um, we would also love it if you guys could give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, you can get these pods uh, wherever you get your favourite podcasts. Um, uh, we, we got one. So I'll, I thought I'd quickly, just quickly read yeah, out okay. as we up yeah. as well. So we got one from um, – it's uh, Frio Girl one So uh, she said here she's like uh, – this year, more than ever, has presented us fantasy coach with various challenges and tough calls to contemplate when picking our starting lineup and listening to these head heads is helping no end. I'm loving all the debates and reasonings for and against and really value all the extra info you guys offer in the community. Cheers to a great 2024. So thanks, uh, Freo Girl, for, for that as well, for the five-star uh, review and uh, rating. It is uh, very much appreciated as well. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you're going to do it, Tim, but uh, I know that you find me at Bales DT as well. Um, and also, what I'll do is for anyone that did want to sign up to the Patreon, uh, follow obviously Rids MJ uh, and Coach Panel wherever. I've actually put all the descriptions in the YouTube at the moment, uh, and then I'll also put them in the description of the podcast. So if you guys do want to go give those guys a follow um, everywhere, then uh, yeah, make sure you do. So I'll, I'll chuck that there. But yeah, Tim, obviously, where can people find you, mate? Um, Tim guest day, you did that at the top of the, uh, top of the, uh, the recording, mate. But look, apart <laughs> from that, guys, we'll let you go on your Saturday night. But best of luck with all your research and trades. And we'll catch you again later on our next uh, Live Space. See, See ya. ya. Cool. Beautiful. Thanks, Reeds. Easy, boys. Thank you. Thanks right, for jumping on, night, mate. mate. Thanks, uh, everyone, for coming on and having a listen. Thanks for all the questions, all that kind of stuff. We appreciate you following. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday nights. See ya. And enjoy Gold Coast, Bales. Thanks, mate. I will.